name is Tony Hayes, and I'd like to welcome you back to the ADK, a series of videos I'm making to chronicle my journey to purchase a piece of land in the woods and turn it into a forever home in the Adirondack Park of upstate New York. In my last video, I talked about three things that I wish I'd known before I started uh, looking to purchase a piece of land. In this video, I'd like to continue with three more things that I wish I'd known before I started this, but I realized that in making my last video, I talked about purchasing raw land, but I never explained what raw land is. So raw land is generally defined as land that doesn't have any kind of improvements or has very few improvements. Um, those improvements being things like a driveway, a well, septic system, and so on. Raw land can be difficult to purchase because it's difficult to get financing from banks and your normal sources where you would get money to purchase a uh, property. And that's because without those improvements or without a home on it, the banks don't have much in the way of collateral should you fail to make your payments. And so getting a loan for raw land is not impossible, but it's generally harder to do. There are fewer banks that will actually provide those loans. And the banks that do provide those loans look for something like 50 to 70% of the land cost up front um, in order to give you a loan. So sometimes you have to do creative financing or get your um, funding through other means. Having said that, um, and understanding the points that I made in the last video about learning about the property and doing the research, tip number one in this video is negotiate with knowledge. Doing the research and finding out everything you can about the property will not only help to make sure you're not stepping into a legal rat's nest, but may actually help to give you some negotiating power as well. The more money you can save on upfront on the purchase of the land means the more money left over in your pocket afterwards to help pay for other things, such as title insurance and surveys that you may not have thought about. By doing the research on the property, you can find out things such as how long has the property been on the market? How many times has the property been on and off the market? Has the seller done anything to improve the land? If the property has been on and off the market several times, especially if the price has dropped every time, and the seller hasn't done anything to improve the land, you still have to pay the taxes on the land. This might mean that they got into the purchase of the land without any real expectation or something came up and they weren't able to actually utilize the land. They might be willing to negotiate the price down in order to just get rid of the tax burden that they have to pay every year on the land. Make sure you've done your research and know what those taxes are. When the property's gone on the market, has the selling price gone up or down? If the price has gone continually down, that could mean the seller is looking to get rid of the property and might be more willing to negotiate on the price within reason. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Is a realtor involved? How long have they been involved with the property? Remember, realtors only get paid when the property is sold. And so you may have a friend there if the property has gone on and off the market and they've had to work on it for several years, um, it might be another selling point in your favor. Again, do the research to find out this information. Also, a realtor can set the tone when it comes to the sale. They're the ones that are actually talking to the seller. And so keep that in mind when you are having your negotiations with a realtor. A realtor can make the purchase easy or hard. And a lot of that's going to come down to how you interact with them. Did you find out about comparables? What are other properties in the area priced at? That may give you an idea of what the seller is looking for and give you some wiggle room if the price on the property is higher than those comparables in the area. Finally, be realistic in your negotiation based on the information that you've learned. Know what the seller paid for the property and understand that they'll probably want to make at least a little profit on it. Also, take into account that if a realtor is involved, they can have a 5 to 6% fee on top of what the seller wants to make. This could still leave you plenty of wiggle room, but you need to understand what the bottom range is based on what the seller paid for it and get a realistic expectation of what you can negotiate down to. I'm not an expert in this, but it seems like if you figure out what you think the lowest price is based on what the seller paid for it, what the realtor's cut is and what other values in the area are, and then offer 95% of that, right? It's below the lowest price, but then you can negotiate up to the actual price that you're hoping for. If you try to go too low and lowball it, 
there's a possibility that you can insult either the realtor or the seller and they're going to walk away from it and then you don't have a chance of buying the property. If you negotiate too high, you may be leaving money on the table. So try and find out what the reasonable selling cost is, go a little bit lower than that, and that gives you room to negotiate back up to where you really want to be. In the best case scenario, the seller agrees to that original price and you actually get a better deal than you expected. Worst case, the seller may balk at it and you can negotiate up a little bit. There'll be a counter offer, you go back and forth. It's a little bit like haggling at a market. But if you don't ask for the lower price, I guarantee you the seller is never going to go down from what they offer. So if you offer above what you think the lowest price is and they accept it, that's it. You're never going to get lower than that. So make sure that you offer a reasonable price that's going to make both you and the seller happy. And then everybody walks away from the deal feeling like they won. Tip number two, get a good lawyer that works in real estate. Real estate law is complicated. So find a good lawyer that works in real estate and also is licensed to work in that state. If you can find somebody local, that's even better because they'll understand what the deals are in that area. When you first get a contract from a realtor, it's likely going to be a boilerplate kind of thing. It's a generic contract that is designed to suit everybody. And in the end, it's probably going to need to be tweaked a little bit to meet the exact circumstances of the property that you're buying. That's where a good real estate lawyer comes in. Every property is unique, so the contract should be unique as well. So the contract should be designed to deal with the unique situation of buying raw land. Contracts can have a built-in expiration date. So make sure when you work with a realtor that you set that date out far enough so that you give your lawyer time to build in contingencies to deal with the specifics of the property that you're buying. Common contingencies include the ability to install a well and a septic system to support a certain size house without the need for any variances from local code, or that the seller can provide a clear title free of any liens, debts, or disputes. Make sure the contract includes time to get everything that you need done, and that may include the time for local surveyors and title insurance to, to get run before the contract expires. This is another reason to do upfront research. Before you go to contract stage, it might be worthwhile to talk to surveyors in the area, find out what your expectations are as far as cost and their time constraints. Again, they're going to be on a schedule, so you have to fit into that schedule. Also find out how long it takes to get title insurance in the area. A good lawyer can work this into the contract to ensure you have the time to get the things done that you need to. I'm not a lawyer, so make sure you hire a good one. Tip number three, find out if the seller has a current survey on the property. And if they don't have one, make sure you build money into your budget to get one. Even though surveys can be expensive, all of the county tax maps and GIS satellite pictures in the world won't help you if down the road you get into a boundary dispute with a neighbor. They build something on your land, and if you don't have a survey, how are you going to prove that? So if there isn't already a current survey on the property, get one. A survey lays out the exact boundaries of the property based on the deed history and may give you an idea of where you can and can't build. Most counties have offsets. These are legal restrictions from building within a certain amount of distance from the property line. So make sure you know exactly where your property line is by getting a survey. This might also be something that's negotiable. Um, ask the seller if they're willing to cover the cost of the survey, and if not, see if they'll lower the price to pay for some or all of the cost of getting a survey if they don't currently have one. When hiring a company to do a boundary survey, consider getting a topographic survey as well, at least the area where you're going to be building. Find out from the local code enforcement or the local permitting process whether you need topographic data of slope in order to actually build on the property. If you're hiring somebody to do a survey anyway, might as well get it all done at once. These are just some of the things that I learned throughout the process of buying a piece of raw land. In the next video, we'll talk a little more in depth about some of the other things that you can do to make that purchase as easy and smooth as possible. If this video has helped you, like and subscribe. It helps me out with the algorithm. Thanks for watching.